Hey, welcome to the Crack House Chronicles True Crime Podcast. I am Donnie, and with me is a man that will go on any hiking trip, as long as he can do it from his couch. It's Dale. You got that right. Yeah. We had this discussion this week, didn't we? <laughs> That's right. Can you see it from the parking lot? <laughs> yeah. Or you can Google it on your phone. That's right. That's right. Bring me some pictures back. Yeah, take me a picture while you're there. What's going on, dude? What's happening, my man? Uh, I'm having a great day. Oh, yeah. No yeah, doubt. yeah, not really, but yeah, I'm having a great day. Well, it's great now, isn't it? Well, it's great now. I'm not at work. Oh, man, I'm telling you. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't want to talk about that. Yeah, it's been a week. It's been a week. <laughs> it has, but I'm ready. Yeah. Big times. Yeah, I know. You're, you're ready. I am. Yep. You got any good shout-outs or anything you want to talk about? Man, we got a couple, man. Uh, we got some uh, Apple Podcast uh, five-star he rode today. Apple Apple Podcast. People know how to do that, don't they? They do, man. Oh man, we love these folks. Um, or three four two one, which is O A R three four two one. Said uh, they were from Charlotte and kind of grew up in Myrtle Beach, and they really loved the local stories and thought we do a pretty good job, and then just enough humor to our dark subject matter. Are we dark subject matter? Yeah, I don't we're know. Dark man. I think we uh, do a pretty good job tap dancing that line. Oh yeah. You know, it's a might, it's a fine line sometimes. Man. I, might, I might get out in the field a little bit sometimes, but you know that is that's part of it. Yeah. <laughs> and we got one for Czar Trump, which is C Z A R Trump, and he just said simply very good and five stars. That's it. Write something in the box and leave a five star. That's right. And you will get a shout out. You getting it? You getting it? Yep. And one more. We have a Google review, which is something new to me. Uh, Jennifer Corona. Thank you so much for your five star review. Yeah, I just got a notification from that the other day, and I didn't know they, people could do that. But yeah, well, apparently you can. Yep, Google review. Get it on just, it. It just popped up <laughs> on my phone, and I was like, "What is this?" Sweet. Yeah. So, Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate yeah. that. If you do a, click a five star anywhere and leave a review, you get a shout out. That's right. Yeah. There's some new designs on the store page. Go over and get you something. Pick you out something cool to wear. Yeah. Everybody needs something cool, man. Yeah. Support the crack house and help keep the lights on. Yeah. You know, it's kind of hard to do it in the dark. Yeah. Well, do the show anyway. <laughs> yeah. Turn the candle on over there. <laughs> Turn the candle on. That's right. Yeah. That's what they used to do back in the old days. Light the lantern. Yeah. Turn the candle on. Turn the candle on. Flip the switch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pay the light bill. That's right. People pay light bills. Don't they? Do they still call it a light bill? I don't know. I call it a power bill. Power bill? Yeah. You know where we're from. Yeah. Yeah. You but, pay the power bill. Yeah, but they don't say anywhere you're getting from duke power you get it from duke energy yeah i'm paying my energy bill yeah whatever i yeah. still pay the power bill yeah i pay the light bill <laughs> same difference that's right <laughs> all right man we are going to get into a pretty weird case this week it is we've done some uh, missing people lately but we're going to get back on the serial killer train well yeah and today we I do not want to ride that train well <laughs> We're going to get on this train. Okay. I said, I'll be back in the car where the bar is. Yeah. We're riding a serial killer train. I don't want to get drunk when I go out. Looking at it from your phone, right? Yeah. Yeah, but we're going to do a serial, <laughs> we're going to do a serial killer today. All right. And this is a guy. His name is William Devin Howell. The third. No, oh. he's just William Devin Howell. Sorry, I was on Gilly Gonzalez yeah. for a second. But he was born on February the 11th, 1970. He's 52 years old today. Well, not today, but he's 52 years old. And he was born in Hampton, Virginia. Virginia. Yep. And just a little bit of backstory on his life, he was the youngest of four boys. Yeah, way young. Yeah. His, he had two older brothers that were close to 20 years old. Yeah, I mean, they were older. One of them was even in Vietnam at the time. I think... Um, William Devin Howe was a bonus child, pretty much. Yeah, um, I think he was He was born, his mother was like 40, which is pretty old to have kids in the 70s. Yeah, it's not uncommon today, I don't think. Right, but then he had, one of his, his uh, next closest was like five years older near so. Yeah. So he had like two that was 20, then him, and then the other one was fairly close, but mm-hmm. not really. But now his older brothers described him as a a child that was pretty much left to roam freely. He could pretty much do what he wanted to do and had latitude to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he wasn't. Well, you know how it is. First kid, you're scared to death and really strict on everything they do. And after you go a long little while, it's like, yeah, he'll just let him do it. Yeah, he'll, he'll learn on his own. He'll figure, <laughs> yeah. he'll figure it out. Now, he grew up in Virginia Beach, like we said. And this was 
close to Langley Air Force Base. I guess we'll just call him Howell through this whole episode. Instead of calling him William Devin Howell, we'll just call him by his last name, Howell. Okay. But some people went, called him Devin, other people called him William, other people called him Bill. Yeah, he usually went by Devin, I think. I think he had a tattoo on his arm with yeah. Devin on it. Yeah, so I'd say that's what he preferred. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if he had Devin on his arm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we're just going to call him Howell okay. as much as we can. But there. But now, by the time he was around 12 years old, his mother developed cancer, Dale. Yeah. It was breast cancer. And she went through a lot with that. Yeah, you know, back Especially in, back, back in the 70s. Yeah, yeah, chemo was rough back in. I mean, yeah. it was rough now, but it was really rough, you know, early. Yeah. You know, it's crazy back in them days. You didn't really hear much about cancer a lot. Mm-mm. And he would uh, come home every day from school and help take care of his mom because I think his dad worked quite a bit. Yeah. So he had to help take care of his mother and do for her because she was pretty much the one who ran the household. Yeah, she he was even described as a, the disciplinary one there oh, yeah. in the house. Yeah. And Tan that hide. Yeah, and Hal would even said at one time that he got a lot of spankings as a kid, but he also said he deserved every one he got. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not like abusive nothing. It's like, you know, back in the day you got your 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 tail warmed up. Mhm. But his entire childhood he, he described it as a pretty normal childhood yeah right so it's not really like a your typical or i guess there is such thing as a typical but you're usually stories of serial killers we got also kind of some kind of weird childhood or stuff going on in the home or you know some kind of abuse whether it be really beaten or sexual or whatever there's always some kind of something or a big a major blow to the head or something yeah. that, that causes that you can kind of go back and point to it and go, well, maybe right here is where we started. But in his, it was not like that. Uh, he, he wasn't the type that would set fires or abuse animals or anything like that. He right. was just a just a regular kid just making his way through life. Right. Now, he did start drinking around 13, I think. Yeah. Trying to cope with all this stuff with his mama. Yeah. But like I said, his mom developed cancer when he was at the age of 12. Yeah. And they were some days, uh, she was just bedridden oh i'm sure and he would come home and she would beg him to go get the gun right well you know after a while you know she had several strokes and she was paralyzed on her left side yeah so that she basically was bedridden after that she just kind of they kind of put her bed where she could see out the wind and that kind of thing and there was days where she begged him to go get your daddy's gun out of the top drawer and you need to go out and play just let Mm -hmm. me do what i need to do but that just killed him but you know he never would do it but it just eat at him yeah I imagine. Now, when he was 14, he had uh, stole his daddy's car. Yep. And he was able to get it out of the driveway without anybody hearing it. And he drove to Newport News, Virginia, and hired his first prostitute. Right. At the age of 14. Mm-hmm. Now, he had, he had girlfriends before then, you know, and he said that, you know, when stuff was going on, he would go see his girlfriends and kind of clean his slate i guess could yeah. go over there and do the you know he was having sex back then with his girlfriends and other friends but and then uh i guess other girls mm-hmm. but then like you said this time there was nobody available so that's when he decided he would try the professional route yeah yeah and he liked it he yeah he was kind of hooked on that yeah and he would uh do odd jobs around the neighborhood cutting grass and different things just to be able to afford that be able to go and Hire his prostitutes. Right. Mm-hmm. And he dropped out of high school when he was 15. Mm-hmm. And he had fathered two children with his high school girlfriend. Right. Yeah, and I said, you know, even though one day he was actually had been taking care of his mom, and then uh, he'd sat there with her for a couple of days because she was pretty bad off. And then he decided to go see his girlfriend while he was over there with them, and they were having sex. He got the number, to, or he got the call that uh, she had passed away. Yeah, while he was with his girlfriend and having yeah, sex. All this while he's fifteen. Yep. Mm-hmm. So you got that to think about too. Oh, the, oh yeah, and I think the his mother going through all that and the death of his mother. I think that was sort of a tilting point for. That might how, have been like the blow to the head. It could have been. Yeah. Just a, an emotional blow to the head. Right. Instead of being dropped on your head as a child. I think that really, really bothered him. Yeah, and then, and then only five years later, his dad passed away. Yeah. You know, so then, and I think even when, before that, he was just kind of living in the garage, I think we read. Mm-hmm. Even on whether they had 
updated it and made it into a bedroom or whatever he was and that made it really easy for him to take the car and go and even he was still doing this and even uh like replacing the gas and rolling back the mileage and all this stuff so it didn't really didn't get caught taking it yeah and then uh like i said you know just a couple years later his dad passed away so he went from being barely supervised to not supervised at all Mm mm-hmm so that's pretty much what he did in his entire life was just doing odd jobs and stuff and supporting his uh little family he had with his girlfriend right. at the time but by the time he reached the age of 30 you know he was living in connecticut and had two children to help support from his days back in virginia and he continued to work steady and his life took uh on a pretty much a repetitive thing you know he was just in relation in unstable relationships and temporary housing and heavy drinking using drugs uh, Howell didn't know how to stay out of trouble. Right. Well, you know, when you're unsupervised, you know, you, what do you what do you care really at this point? Yeah. Go ahead. Which, you know, it kind of led him to push the envelope. But in the decade leading up to his arrest in 2005 for manslaughter that we we're going to talk about, he racked up a number of convictions for drugs and along with larceny and burglary in Virginia. Right. And he was even locked up in Georgia and New Jersey as well so he's he's racking them up yeah and most of the charges surrounded his drinking and pot smoking habits along with driving on a suspended license yeah he was, that was his main problem i think he didn't ever have a license but since he started drinking it said basically he said it was hardly ever a day since he was 13 that he didn't drink i know so it's not easy to keep a driver's license with that yeah now in early 2002 when he was 31 years old he took a job with Benco Roofing. This was in Torrington, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. And he purchased a Ford Econoline. This was a van yeah. for $400. Nice one. Yeah. We're going to post pictures of this van. <laughs> and we're going to talk a little bit more about this van, too. But right. He, oh, yeah. He purchased this Ford Econoline van for $400 from his former girlfriend's mother. Right. That he lived with off and on. And her name was Dory Holcomb. Yeah. But this Ford van, man, it was in rough shape. Yeah, it run good, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah. And it had enough room in the back to store his belongings and keep his tools that he had when he'd done these little odd jobs as a landscaper and whatever he'd done. Mm-hmm. And to be able to sleep in the back of this van. Right. But he lost his apartment that winter and lived in the van when he wasn't staying with Dory. Right. Now, how had asked his boss at Benco, his name was Eric Benson, would it be okay if he used the company parking lot to park his van and sleep in the van just for a few weeks, I guess, trying to find a place to stay or something. And he ended up working at Benco for the next eight months. And during this time, his fantasies of raping women started to increase. Yeah, I guess he's just laying in that van thinking about it. Yeah, but it became a part of his life. Yeah. And this uh, boss, Benson, he recalled how as a good worker and a, had a wonderful personality and even said it'd be okay to park behind the shop. Yeah, no problem. Just, you know, sleep in the van and come to work, get up and come to work. Yeah, just get out of the car and go. Yeah. Yeah, I think he was going like to the YMCA and stuff and taking showers, so it wasn't like he was just staying in their state <laughs> yeah most of the time anyway yep now a year later his temporary home on wheels deal it would turn itself into what he labeled it as the murder mobile yeah and he would use the benco parking lot not only to sleep but to rape women before strangling them to death mm. so i guess he was picking up some prostitutes and he was just escalating is all it was. Yeah. All right, Dale, we're going to jump ahead to the year 2003. And this was when it was the violent death of Nilsa Arizmendi. She was 33 years old in July that year. And that's what sent Howell to jail. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Nilsa, she was a mother of four. And she was reported missing by her longtime boyfriend, Ace Sanchez. Yeah. And he had saw her get into Hal's van. Well, you know, Hal had uh, been hanging out with them. Yes. Doing crack together and 
hanging out the motel. Yeah, they lived in a motel, so they were all doing crack together and hanging out together. Having three ways together. Three ways together and a bunch of this other stuff. And then the last time he had saw her, she got in the van with him, and then he hadn't seen her since. He went back, you know, uh, from wherever they were partying and hanging out at the hotel and waiting, and she never showed up. And Ace Sanchez, he was considered a suspect on um, oh, for sure. Nilsa's disappearance. Yeah. I think he took two polygraph tests. He failed the first one. Yeah, well, it looked deceptive, they said. Yeah, then he took a second one and passed it with flying colors. Right. And it could have been up to, because of nervousness or something. I mean, it, I mean, they were doing illegal stuff. Oh, so. yeah, for sure. But like Dale said, he he did see her get into Howe's van. Right. But now this was on uh, July the 31st. 2003 there was a woman told police that her sister who was 33 years old this was one we're talking about nilsa arismendi had not been heard from for seven days and arismendi's sister told police that she was a heroin user and a sex worker Mm -hmm. who was living in the motel in westerfield along with her boyfriend ace and he told investigators that he and arismendi had allowed how to stay overnight in their room and that he saw Arismendi at 2.30 a.m. on July the 25th, 2003, when she got into Howe's van. And Arismendi's body was found on April the 28th, 2015. This was many, many years later. Right. That we're going to talk about. Right. All right, Dale. Howe became a suspect in Arismendi's disappearance in April of 2004. And police... They seized his van in Dare County, North Carolina, and discovered that several of the seat cushions had been taken out. Right. And blood from two people were, was found underneath some carpet. Right. So he had taken the seat cushions out trying to hide his tracks, but mm-hmm. he didn't pull the carpet out. So what had happened is they had bled out in the, in the van, and it got underneath the carpet. Yep. And DNA was taken from Arizmendi's relatives, and it was determined that one of the blood samples was a 99% certain to have come from Arizmendi. Right. And they also found six videotapes of how having some bizarre sex with women, but the videos were shot in a way where you couldn't see their faces. Right. And it wasn't clearly visible. I'm intrigued. Yeah. What is bizarre sex with women? What, yeah, are, they, like, what are they considered? What is bizarre sex? I don't know. Don't Google it, I'm sure. <laughs> no. I got enough in my Google search history to probably convict me of something right now. Just doing these podcasts. Right. But because um Ares Mindy's body had not been found at that time, Hal was charged with first degree manslaughter. And he was also later charged with witness tampering after threatening another inmate. Yeah. Now in uh January of 2007, shortly after the trial began, Hal entered an Alfred plea yep. to first-degree manslaughter, meaning that he did not admit to the crime but conceded that the prosecution had enough evidence to get a conviction. Correct. Yep. And at sentencing, Hal continued to insist that he did not kill Arismendi, and he argued that the bloodstains was from a physical fight that Arismendi had in the van with her boyfriend. And he also tried to get his alpha plea thrown out, yeah. claiming that he only entered the plea because the public defender pressured him. Right. But Hal was sentenced to 15 years in prison for her death. Right. Even though they didn't have a body. So they couldn't prove it, but they uh, he just said went ahead and said, "Okay, you got enough. It looks like you got enough to to get me, but I'm not saying I did it, but you got it. You know. It looks like I did it. Yeah. Yeah." That's rough there. They're taking, give me the 15 years. Yeah. All right, Dale. Just weeks later, a hunter found human bones behind the West Farm shopping mall in West Hartford, Connecticut. Yes. And they were trying to find out who these bodies belonged to. Yeah. Yeah, they said that uh, West Farms is kind of, you know, kind of a uh, uppity section of Connecticut. You know, mm-hmm. you'd always see high-end cars and stuff in the shopping center and stuff. But And then behind it, I think there was like a, a ravine and then uh some woods yeah and that's kind of where they found these bodies but but this wooded area is marshy and pretty inaccessible by a vehicle which was kind of shocking to me or shocking i don't know how big this wooded area was but if this was a you know a pretty high-end place what's this guy hunting for that's that's yeah (laughs) behind the shopping center right 
Oh, that was one. And then I haven't seen it anywhere. It just says a hunter found. It doesn't say what he was hunting. Mm-hmm. All right, Dale. They found some bodies out there in that wooded area behind this shopping plaza. And one of them was Diane Cusack. Mm-hmm. She was a 55-year-old New Britain resident. And she disappeared in mid-2003. And police had last had contact with her on July 9th uh, during a landlord-tenant dispute. And her remains were found behind the New Britain shopping plaza in 2007. And she was identified in 2011. But Cusack, who had a substance abuse problem, had been in out of contact with her family for years and had never been reported missing. Right. So she was just estranged from everybody. Yep, strung out. Mm-hmm. Most of these most of these are on heroin. Yep. Now, the next body they found was Joy Valine Martinez. She went by Joy. She was 23 years old, and she went missing on October the 10th, 2003. But she was not reported missing until March 29th of 2004. And suspicion arose when she did not show up for her birthday party. And she was spotted in her hometown of East Hartford, where she lived with her mother. And in high school, she had been a track star. And at the time of her disappearance, she was unemployed. And her remains were some of the first to be removed from the shopping plaza area in 2007. And she was identified in 2013. So they had these remains for years. Before they even knew who it was. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty sad, man. Mm-hmm. From big track star to this uh, damn uh, heroin will get you, man. Yep. PSA, folks. Yep. Yeah, stay away from the heroin. And the next body they found, her name was Mary Jane Menard. She was a 40-year-old substance abuse counselor from Waterbury, wow. Connecticut. And she went missing from New Britain, in October 2003, and her remains were found in the shopping plaza in 2007. But see, what happened was she'd had some surgery, and she'd gotten addicted to pain pills. Mm. And when she was trying to get off of them, she was in counseling to get off of these pills, and one of the uh, people in there with her got her addicted to heroin. Well, you know, that happens a lot, especially with opiates. You know, people get addicted to pain pills. And then they start going looking for pain pills, and then they start buying from pain pills from anywhere they can find them. And then when they can't find them, people lead them to heroin because you, you know, they can get that cheaper, and it's basically the same thing, mm-hmm. but it's a lot more deadly, a lot more dangerous. Yeah. But sadly, sadly, that's that's the way it goes. People start off with pain pills, and then it just keeps escalating until you get there. You can't find them no more, or nobody will give them to you. Or you can't buy them from anybody else then people send you that way mm-hmm. sad more remains were discovered on april of 28 2015 now, how, how many years later was this this was a couple years later yeah i know several i mean i know after some of them were identified yes i know all these bodies were there at the time they just didn't find them at the time mm-hmm. which is wild because they were buried spread out yeah yeah i said basically they were buried like in a baseball diamond mm-hmm. you know and they're all pretty shallow like what two foot i think you said yeah because of the water table yeah the water table yeah and the next one that was found is this was the nilsa arismendi right a female that we talked about earlier this was his first victim yeah so now when they found the body now they kind of started thinking here it's fixing to start linking some stuff together yeah and then his next victim her name was marilyn gonzalez and she was a 26 year old woman and the mother of two children. She went missing in 2003 after she left her home in Waterbury. Right. And her body was found behind the West Farm Shopping Mall in Farmington, Connecticut, on April 28, 2015. The next was a female named Melanie Ruth Camellini. And she was a 29-year-old mother of two from Seymour, Connecticut. And she went missing on January the 1st, 2003. And she had been recently living in Waterbury and was last seen in that area with two men. And she was known to have had a substance abuse problem who would regularly disappear for long periods of time. Right. And her body was discovered behind the New Britain Shopping Center. Same place. Yep, and identified in 2015. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, and all these went missing in, I think, in about a nine-month period, actually, mm-hmm. when they get her back to it. All right, now his next victim was Danny Lee Whisnett, who went by Janice Roberts. Who was 44 years old 
and Janice was last seen on June the 25th, 2003. Now, get this. Hal believed that Janice to be a female right. and picked her up from the streets for sex. Mm-hmm. Now, when he figured out that Janice was transgender. He flipped out. Yeah, he flipped out big time. What it was, he grabbed her by the hair and the wig come off. Yeah, he was doing his thing and he grabbed her. Yeah, and the wig, when the wig came off, he just flipped out. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine. Yeah, I'm sure he was in shock. But he killed Janice out of rage. Yeah. And even at Hal's sentencing, Janice's sister, April Rich, read a statement. Your size and force ripped away our lives that did not belong to you. I hope the words that you hear today resonate in your soul for the rest of your life. You may be able to protect yourself physically in prison, but there is no weapon that will protect you from your own thoughts. Mm, dang, that's heavy. That's deep words, man. Yeah. And uh, Janice was the only one that was not a drug user. Yeah. Yeah, the rest of them were. She, she was just sex for money. Yeah. Yeah. But at, at that point, he was just, I guess if if she had been a, hadn't been a transgender, he would have killed her. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Now, I know that, you know, there's also saying, you know, there were lots of times that he didn't kill them. Mm-hmm. And most of the time, you know, it said that uh, the only time he, you know, well, not the only time, but like, because he had a grass cutting service. And if he had a, uh, a job the next morning, then he wouldn't go out or he wouldn't, he wouldn't kill them. But if he did, he, or if he, if he didn't have a uh, job the next morning, he knew he could take as long as he wanted to. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these people, when he... Uh, Took them and raped them. He would keep them over 12 hours, torturing and raping over and over. In the back of his van. Yes. And that's that's what it was. It was his murder mobile. Even taking naps in between rape sessions while they were tied up. Yeah, bleeding and beat up. Yeah. He would just take a nap and then and wake was, up and start back over. One of the females, he hit her in the head with a hammer, mm-hmm. thinking it would kill her. And it didn't. And she said, I've got kids. And that was when he just choked her just begging her to die oh gosh yeah but this was all in the parking lot right there in that shopping center right right next to mcdonald's and he would take them to mcdonald's and get them something to eat and some of them that would be their last meal oh gosh yeah and he told them if they made any noise he would kill them right he would kill them anyway yeah well most of them well yeah he did he knew you know when the first time he ever did it you know when he he always fantasized about raping uh prostitutes and said the first time he did it he knew he was gonna have to kill him just to to keep it quiet Mm -hmm. yeah yeah but the victims were identified as uh seven women one of whom was transgender right and their bodies were discovered behind the shopping plaza there in hartford in new britain right beginning in 2007 yeah you know and and how later told a cellmate that there was a monster inside of him and, and described himself as quote a sick ripper you know, which led to how to being referred to as the sick river by the media. He also told them that, you know, he would keep some of the, he kept one of the women's bodies in his van for two weeks because it was too cold outside the barrier. The ground was froze. Yeah. And uh, he attempted to bury her and he couldn't get in there so he couldn't figure out what to do. So he rolled her up in a tarp and just kept her in the van and slept, slept beside her. So he, he slept next to her and called her, called her, called her his baby. Wow. And then uh, he remembered that uh, seeing, um, that uh ravine behind the shopping center um his girlfriend at at the time worked in a um a hair salon in that shopping center and he would take her lunch so they would go out back and eat and that's where he'd seen the ravine and in the big lot or whatever Mm -hmm. and uh so he remembered that because he said you know a lot of people dump the limbs and grass clippings and some trash and stuff would be in there and he remembered seeing a barrel in there so he went back and took her and put her in a barrel and uh he went back to wherever I think he went down to Virginia for a while, and then he came back and then actually took her later and then uh, buried her later. But he had actually had cut off her fingertips and then dismounted her bottom jaw, trying to t- get get her teeth out of her head so they couldn't identify the body. Mm-hmm. This was Melanie Camellini. So that's pretty rough. Yeah. And then later, what he would do is discover, drive over there, and dump the bodies in that ravine. And then come back the next day or so and park his van at the McDonald's next to it and then walk over there and then go bury him. That's crazy. So he wouldn't spend so much time at once to not get caught. Yeah. 
It's amazing these little shopping centers, man. Ain't no telling what's behind some of these. Well, that's right. These places, you know, and and even uh, where to interview with the the lady that wrote the book, um, his garden, that uh, Ann K. Howard. Yeah, said that uh, you know if you were at the drive through at the window, you could actually like turn your head to the right, and his van would be parked over there sometimes in the corner. And there was times that he was doing, he was killing and raping in the middle of the day. So while people was going through the drive through over in the van when some of the van the windows were busted out and they were plywood it over so you couldn't see in it anyway but so you'd be in there doing this while the people's just coming through the drive through and we're gonna post pictures of this van <laughs> yeah it's creepy as hell yeah it is i've seen a lot of as my kids call them molester man vans <laughs> <laughs> i've seen a lot of them but this one probably takes the cake sketchy vans yeah but by the time Hal turned into a serial killer he was semi-homeless um, hell he's been homeless the whole time man. yeah about. i mean listen, right up well to the, they took his van i guess now he is yeah right up to the day he was arrested yeah and how like we said he eventually referred to his dumping ground as his garden yeah and extensive interviews with this attorney ann k howard she was the one that published this book like we talked about she published it in 2018 this little area that he buried the bodies was tucked far enough away from the asphalt that it could not be reached by a vehicle hmm. But all the murders occurred in 2003. Yeah. During the nine-month period, like we said. It was the 2003 a murder of uh, Nilsa Arizmendi that, him, yeah. that sent him to jail the first time. We know if if he hadn't killed her or, or if the, the boyfriend hadn't went and said, you know, I know where she was, hell, they might have never got him. Ace Sanchez, yeah. Yeah. He put him on the trail. Yeah, they sure did. But, they, you know how he was described as a pretty nice guy everybody he you know did work for landscaping he was very friendly he called you know was very polite yes sir no sir yes ma'am no ma'am even the kids in the town loved him that he was funny loved to hang out with him Mm -hmm. just a very nice guy but he had like another side of him that loved to kill and loved sex and prostitutes crazy yeah and this uh lady Ann Howard that wrote the book on him. She interviewed him several times and even developed a close friendship with him and said that if if he was out today she wouldn't have a problem living across the street from him. She would, you know, be his neighbor. I don't know about that. Yeah. Said uh he he's he feels bad for the families that he messed up. But he is a killer. I mean, he is serving life in prison. Yeah, he's got like 360 years to, to do. So maybe she could say that and not having to worry about it because I don't know if that, I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, I mean, it's just there ain't no way I'd do it. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, another thing is like even when he was with uh, with them at the motel and doing the crack, he didn't even really do the crack. He didn't. He said it made him sick. Like I think right after his mom passed away, he went and bought like. Three hundred dollars worth of crack, and him and a prostitute went to a hotel for three days, and said he tried it like twice and made him sick both times. Mm-hmm. So he, she was just there doing her, and she did all the crack, I guess. But he said he loved smoking pot. Oh yeah, pot and alcohol. That was his gimmick. Yeah, it relaxed him and made him feel good. Yep. Now, when he was in jail in North Carolina, Dare County, you know, he was caught for misdemeanor of driving without a license. That's when. Uh, he was starting to be connected with these other murders in Connecticut. Now, when they came and got him from Connecticut, they extradited him back to Connecticut, and he was wondering why they would come so far just on a misdemeanor charge driving without a license. Right. And that's when uh, they showed him a picture of one of his victims, and that's when he got quiet. Yeah, they started asking him a few questions, and then he figured out he better just keep his damn mouth shut. Yeah, I need a lawyer. Yeah. But he was sentenced to 360 years in prison yep six consecutive life sentences mm-hmm. on november 17 2007 Howell was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences after pleading guilty to the murders of cusack martinez menard gonzalez camelini and wisnet he cried to apologize to the families and victims during the sentence and called his actions monstrous cowardly and selfish mm-hmm. he told the court that he deserved a death penalty which was abolished in 2015 in connecticut so that's why he got them 360-something years. Yes. So you don't have to worry about him getting out. But he is currently serving his life sentence in the Cheshire Correctional Center mm-hmm. in Connecticut. 
Yep. So he is never seeing the light of day. No. And it's reported, you know, he he has no friends, nobody write him except for this attorney that wrote the autobiography on him or the biography on him. Yeah, and she says she don't see him talk to him too much anymore. She's trying to separate, I think, from him now. Yeah, at the time, she was going to see him once a month when she was doing her book. Yeah, for like two or three years. Yeah. Yeah. But now, and then she cut it back to a couple times a year. Yeah, and said, you know, once once he uh, he uh, come out and confessed and then told her he felt like he needed to tell her all the details. So all the stuff she got in her head was starting to bother her. So she, after writing the book, everything, she's trying to start separating a little bit. And then slowly, the letter slowed down. And then uh, she quit taking his phone calls. Like, she just had to decompress, I guess. Mm-hmm. I, can, I can't imagine. Yeah. But she... Um she friended him and she said that she let him read the manuscript of her book after she completed it and he he got pretty mad about it saying that she portrayed him as a monster and not like you know somebody with feelings and emotions there's pretty much as a killer well she probably went in trying to be extra friendly to get him to say what she needed for the book and so he kind of slowly over the years let down his guard and thought maybe they was really friend friends. Mm-hmm. And then when his book come out, he thought she might paint him in a better light instead of what he really was. And that's probably ticked him off. Well, she told him at the very beginning that uh, he is a project. Oh, yeah. And that she was going to write a book about him. Right. So she didn't hide anything. Yeah, well, I ain't saying she lied to him. I'm just saying what he thought. Yeah. You know, he probably thought it was going to be, since we're friends, you know, she's not going to really make you sound out to be this monster that he really is Mm -hmm. so now if you want to read this book it's called his garden conversations with a serial killer and it is an autobiographical and biographical true crime novel by ann k howard right and she is a practicing attorney yep that is william devon howell william devon howell yeah the the third no he's not third from gilligan's (laughs) island i'm trying yeah he's (laughs) They're serving 360 years. Yeah. William Devin Howell, 360. The third. The third. All right, Dale, we are going to get out of here. All right, man, let's roll. We want everyone to be safe, be careful, and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is the Crack House Chronicles. Chronicles.